Hello, this is Stacy Francis with Francis Financial, here to talk about our quarterly wrap-up and investment forecast. The big question, the market is sizzling hot this summer. How long is it going to continue? We're going to cover that information and a whole lot more today in our call. Most importantly, you want to make sure you're comfortable, you've got your pen, you've got your paper ready to go to make sure that you're able to take as much information from this meeting as possible. Let me tell you a little bit about why this is important. We're seeing that volatility is only increasing, and the political environment that we are in makes many people say that they are more frightened, more concerned about their investments than any other time in history. So with that, the most important thing is knowledge. And knowledge is power. That's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. Because you should understand your investments. You should be able to feel confident and in control no matter what the market throws you. So with that, let's get going. We've got a lot to get through, not as much time as as we might like, and ready to, to do some work here. So here is our agenda. We've got a lot on the agenda. We're going to be talking about a market review, investment outlook, your specific portfolio and how we are managing portfolios, investment tips, and most importantly, a second opinion service for any individuals that might want a second opinion about their investment portfolio. The reason why I bring this up, there was a recent Wall Street Journal article talking exactly about this, that 81% of investors would like a second opinion. Well, I have to say I totally get it. If I am going to go in for surgery, as I did with my knee, and I had knee surgery about 10 weeks ago, I actually didn't go to the just the first surgeon. I went and made sure I got a second opinion that surgery was actually necessary. Well, it was, and the good news is, is I just spent the weekend playing paintball with my son, never thought I would do that one, but trust me, I was running faster than I ever have. So thank goodness it was a good decision, but that second opinion definitely gave me peace of mind, and that's what a second opinion about is all about. It either is just reaffirming that you're 100% on track, could be giving you certain tips, or it could be a complete you need to change directions, and this is why. So let's get started. The market, in particular, this last quarter has been on fire. In fact, U.S. and international stocks are continuing to move forward and reach wonderfully high levels. In fact, we're seeing many of our clients are pretty darn happy. In fact, if you look at the World Stock Market Index, so that is both U.S. as well as international domestic, uh, international developed, as well as international emerging market stocks, we've seen a really nice quarter. And so you can see this quarter starting from the very beginning of April through the end of June that we've seen this long-term march upwards that started back in the re rally and the recovery from February 20 February 2009 onwards is really where we've continued to see this straightforward march upwards. So we're continuing to see that which is great news and where are those returns coming from? Well, in this chart I'm just giving you a little bit of a eye view into what things looked like uh, particularly for the June time period. And so most recently, this last um, the last June, we have the, the numbers here, and then we even have quarterly and year-to-date. What have been our all-star performers? Well, it's the Russell 1000 growth. So that is large company stocks that have a growth focus. We're going to go through the difference between value and growth going forward, but just know what we're seeing here for large company stocks as well as small company stocks, growth-oriented U.S. stocks are outperforming. Other benchmarks, areas that we've seen unbelievable great returns. Um, Europe has roared back. You can see developed international was up over 6% just in the last quarter. And emerging markets, 3.4%. 
Now, however, for the year, they're doing phenomenally. In fact, you're, we're seeing from emerging markets up 15% this year. Great news. Well, overall, what does this mean? Are you feeling like it's volatile in the stock market? I know for a lot of people, a lot of people is the answer is yes. But I have to tell you, I have to tell you, and you may not believe me, but we've actually had smooth sailing. We've had smooth sailing versus historically what the volatility, the ups and downs, the changes in price of stocks on the stock market. Overall, we've actually had pretty, very, pretty all-time low volatility in stocks. And, and let's just go back to what we consider the most volatile time period, and that is the year of 2008 as well as 2009. You can see that the volatility here is extremely, extremely high, whereas here we have more recently below average volatility, below average volatility. Now, I know that many of you might not feel like there's been this smooth sailing in the stock market. Part of it is because there are certain other areas of our lives where there has been a whole lot more volatility. And that area is specifically with politics. But I love to quote Warren Buffett because he's just such a smart and wise man. He had said this quote that I am I'm stealing and sharing with you today. And he said, if you mix politics with your investment decisions, guess what? You're making a big mistake. So what he's essentially saying is that all the volatility, the craziness that we are seeing currently in our current state of politics, that should not necessarily be the driver of how you make long-term investment decisions. So while we're seeing volatility in the political environment, the market itself is actually, as I mentioned, an all-time low, and you need to think about the market in long term, not necessarily what's going on in the White House. I know that you may still be concerned, but we're going to keep on talking about this and talking a little bit more about what do you do to protect your for portfolio from the surprises that could happen. With that, let's talk about something that is a surprise to a lot of people, but not necessarily a surprise to us, and that is the U.S. dollar. We have seen the U.S. dollar continue to rise against other currencies, but we expect going forward that it's going to drop in value. Which currencies has it increased the value against most significantly? You can see here against the euro, as well as against the British pound. Well, I will tell you, I'm actually not complaining about this. I'm not complaining about this because I'm actually leaving in just a few days to go to the Netherlands and going to be visiting also Amsterdam. I am significantly, significantly benefiting from the fact that the U.S. dollar is so strong against the euro. In fact, it has done a haircut on the cost of what our housing was going to be there in Amsterdam. And it also, once I get there, we'll see that eating out will be a lot less expensive. But this trend of the U.S. dollar, this trend of the U.S. dollar increasing in value is going to only stop. It's going to stop. It's going to put its heels in. And we're going to see most likely that the U.S. dollar is going to decrease. In fact, let's take a look at this. The collapse of the U.S. dollar is something that we actually have seen recently. This is, we just reached the dollar's drop to a 12 month low. And that occurred right within right coming before July. So we are seeing that we had a big drop. The dollar recovered a little bit after, um, but then again had another drop to closer to where we are, are actually trading on the U.S. dollar today. 
So what does that mean? Um, that means that if you have any currency hedged investments internationally, you might want to think about taking the hedge off. Let me let me explain why, because I know that I just used three very, very uh, technical terms. That is currency, hedge, and taking the hedge off. So if you have an investment that is denominated in euros and you are holding it and the U.S. dollar becomes stronger, the value of your investment, unfortunately, will go down. No fault to your own. Just the fact that that euro has gone down in value, the worth of it has gone down in value versus the U.S. dollar. How do you protect yourself from that? Well, something we did, which many smart people do, is that they hedged that position. So that, that currency hedge meant that whether or not the dollar went up or down in value, that investment was protected. That investment was protected. However, a hedge is not free. You have to pay for it. There's an expense. And so what we are doing with our investments is that we're actually investing in international international mutual funds that do not have a hedge. We don't want to pay for that protection, that protection against the U.S. dollar going up in value and having it hurt the value, the, the return of that mutual fund. We're not going to pay for that hedge if we no longer worry that the U.S. dollar is going to increase. In fact, we expect the U.S. dollar to decrease in value, essentially adding a little bit more boost, a little bit more return to our international investments. So that, again, just is kind of a, a finance 101 of what you need to think about. When you're looking at your international investments, dive a little closer into those investments and see if there is a currency hedge. If there is, now is a good time to take that hedge off, to invest in another lower cost international fund that, that doesn't have that. Again, you're going to benefit dramatically from the US dollar decreasing in value and big picture here, that's what we're expecting over the next several years. So US stocks, US stocks have continued to do very well. And what we have seen over time is that the economy is continuing to grow at a, a slow but a, a steady pace. And what we've highlighted here in green is our current economic expansion. It's actually now the third longest U.S expansion in history. The only longer expansion started in March 1991 and then followed by February 1961. In fact, I put this in here after World War II. Um, the average expansion since then, um, we've seen to be many fewer months. In fact, it was only an average of about 61 months of expansion. Here, you can see that we're actually approaching 100 months of expansion. So that question that we asked, the market is sizzling hot, how long will it continue? Well, we have concerns that it won't continue forever. It doesn't mean that we're going to see a drop tomorrow. But we're going to be talking about, over the next five years, a very different outlook for U.S. stocks. It's not going to happen immediately because things are looking actually pretty positive. There are some very significant positive economic indicators that are boosting the U.S. stock market and driving it forward. In particular, the labor market is strengthening. We're seeing historic low unemployment levels, which is great. We're slowly slowly seeing wage rises for individuals. Households, balance sheets are better. The debt that plagued so many U.S. families back in the late, late 90s has been cleaned up significantly. We're seeing much lower, much lower levels of debt, 
particularly much lower levels of credit card debt, which is a very, very good thing. Consumers are feeling pretty confident. They're seeming, feeling pretty con- confident. I mean, we're going actually on nearly 100 months of an expansion. So it makes sense that consumers are, are starting to feel better that overall their financial state is, is good. Their financial state is good. Low interest rates are, are continuing to stay low. We are seeing some increases, but overall, historically, they're very low, making being able to afford buying a home very inexpensive, keeping credit card rates down lower. These are all positive things that add to increased uh, positive feeling about the overall economy. And we're also benefiting from low energy prices and low inflation. I know that with driving out to the Poconos for my paintball expedition with my son, filling up was not nearly as expensive as it was a year or two ago. So I felt very significantly that increase in extra money in my pocket. Uh, Before, there's no way I could have filled up my entire tank for $25. And I was able to do that this weekend. In fact, I was a little bit nervous that maybe the the gas pump didn't put enough gas in. So I tried to put a little bit more and guess what? It clicked off. So no, really, I filled up my tank for $25. A year ago, it was significantly more expensive for me to do that. So there's a lot of positive economic indicators of why the U.S. stock market is doing so well. However, the challenge we have is where is it going to go from here? Where is it going to go from here? And the area that has done the best is actually growth. Growth stocks have outperformed, and they've outperformed pretty significantly. You can see for the quarter, large growth stocks outperformed by 4.67% versus large value was only a little over 1%. Small growth company stocks went up by 438 nine percent whereas small cap in general small value small value stocks only went up barely barely even positive so what we're seeing is that growth is definitely outperforming value stocks where we are right now and today long term though that's typically not the case but i know what you're saying Let me clarify for you first, what is considered a growth stock? And uh, we often call them the FANG stocks. And I have a nice picture here, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. As a rule, growth stocks are companies that tend to grow very quickly. So they are in industries such as technology, healthcare, discretionary consumer, spending as well. Those tend to be what we consider growth stocks. Google is your big behemoth growth stock right there. And I love Google because it starts with a G. And what, guess what? Growth stocks start with a G too. So whenever you think about growth stocks, think Google. And that paves the way for totally understanding what type of stock it is. Now, don't forget value. Value is important. And you need 50% of your stocks to be growth. And you need 50% of your stocks to also be value stocks. Value stocks, as a general rule, are financial companies, energy, consumer staples like GE, General Electric. And you're buying them not because you expect them to grow through the roof because the company is expanding rapidly. You're buying these stocks because you believe they are actually undervalued. And so you see, wow, this stock has a good amount of value. It has a good value to it. And I expect it to go up over time because I feel like the value long term is actually higher. It's important, very, very important to have both growth and value stocks. And the reason is, is that sometimes Google will do really well. And then other times companies that are value oriented like GE, General Electric that I mentioned, are going to do well. How have value versus growth stocks done over the long term? Well, here we have a wonderful chart. We made this chart going all the way back to 1995. And in the bottom portion, it shows you the years that growth stocks did better, growth stocks outperformed. And then we have above, above, that, above that line, we have the years where value stocks outperformed. And 
Overall, value stocks have outperformed most years, most years since 2006, but just not this year. This is really important. This is really important for those individuals who have decided with their portfolio or maybe their advisor has decided with their portfolio that they're going to invest primarily in dividend-paying stocks. It makes sense. Why not own a stock that can go up in value but also pays you a dividend? You make money two ways. Well, what you can see here is that it's not always a sure bet because dividend-paying stocks are also known as value stocks. They're value stocks. And as we can see, for example, if you were primarily value stocks here this last quarter, you would have significantly underperformed. Remember that large growth, nearly a 5% return? The, the value portion, nearly just a little over 1%. You would have missed out on some amazing growth. That is why it's so important. It's so important to have a diversified portfolio, a mixture of both value as well as growth stocks. And so let's talk a little bit about the stock market. I hear concerns every day. Are we hitting an all-time peak? What's going to happen? Well, we have seen increasing profit margins and, that, and many other positive parts of the economy. We've talked about higher wage growth, lower unemployment, additional consumer optimism that things are good, tightening up and beautiful balance sheets with less debt by your average U.S. citizen, all good things. And what it's done, as you can see here, it's helped us have this, again, march upwards here in U.S. stocks. Are we at an all-time high? Well, you can see we're not. But, however, you can see the all-time high, which was essentially 2001, and then we had a big drop. And then we saw another all-time high in what? 98, I'm sorry, in 2008, and then we also had a big drop. So this is concerning. It's not that we're going to see a huge negative drop tomorrow, but what it does mean is that the stock market returns over the next five years from particularly U.S. stocks, are not going to necessarily be as heavy, as heady, and as positive, and as significantly high as we've seen in the next, in the last five years. So where can you go? Where should you put some of your money if you're going to invest cash or if you're going to tweak your allocation? It's right here. It's in international stocks. International stocks. We'll talk about have significantly outperformed U.S. stocks. They've outperformed U.S. stocks most recently, and it's really quite significant. In fact, let's take a look at this. So this is year-to-date. So in gray, it's showing you from January through to the end of June. And then we have just the second quarter. So that is from the, end, from the beginning of April through the end of June. With this information, we're seeing that U.S. stocks for the year are up 9%, small company stocks up 4.8%, and this is the big story. Developed international up almost 15%. In fact, we broke it down to the countries that are performing the best, and which countries are those? It's Mexico. It is China. It is India. It is Europe, France, and significantly Spain. I also put the U.S. because I think it's really important to see where we are compared to some of these other developing and developed international nations. We saw significantly that the, Euro grow, the Eurozone is growing and increasing significantly. And we're seeing that the GDP is experiencing a very steady increase. And you can see this increase, particularly over these last couple months of 
2017. What does this tell you? Well, GDP is just a fancy way of saying, what is the growth rate of this part of the world? And the Eurozone has had a really significant recovery. In fact, if you remember back in 2012, 2013, we saw negative growth rates. So the, the economy in Europe was actually contracting. Well, we've reversed that trend, and we're continuing to see this, again, beautiful, steady increase in growth. And, and why is that important? Well, that's important because over the next five years, we expect this part of the market to have many opportunities for making money. It's an area where we believe clients should be. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking Brexit. Well, can I tell you that after, after the ripple effect of Brexit went through the markets, we have recovered. In fact, the Eurozone is trading at levels significantly higher than they were trading even before Brexit. So we're seeing, again, great positive news. Other great positive news, emerging market stocks. Emerging market stocks are outperforming U.S. stocks. In fact, quite significantly. Here we see the, that same chart, but we included emerging markets to show you what that looks like. So large U.S. stocks up 9.3%, as I mentioned. Small U.S. stocks up 4.8%. And emerging markets, that's the real story here. So far in the last six months, from January through the end of, of June, emerging markets have returned 15%, which is just really encouraging and very exciting, particularly for our portfolios, because we have a good amount of emerging market exposure in there. So now that we've talked about U.S. stocks, Europe, developed international, as well as emerging markets, what does the airbag of your portfolio look like? And what should you expect from bonds? Well, there's good news and there's bad news. And I love these little smiley faces and little sad faces. In understanding how bonds react, you have to understand the relationship between interest rates and bond prices. When interest rates go down, bond prices go up. When interest rates go up, bond prices go down. And where are we at? Well, we're in this situation, that as interest rates go up, we're seeing bond prices potentially, uh, especially in the future, go down. So let me give you this example. You've got two bonds. They're issued by the exact same company, the same credit quality, same duration. Uh, you'll get your money back in three years. The first one was issued paying you 1.5%. But then the Federal Reserve increased interest rates. So the new bond issued, same exact everything now, is actually offering you 2%. So being a rational investor, which bond would you prefer? The one paying 1.5% or the one paying 2%, all things being the same? Well, you're going to choose the one paying 2%, of course. So what does that do for that bondholder that still has the bond paying 1.5%? It means that when they go to sell it, it's not going to be as attractive. Its price is going to come down, which kind of makes sense, right? Well, that's really important. That's really important for, for individuals to, to understand because bonds are essentially – a stable part of your portfolio. That's what they're, they're meant to do. But it doesn't mean that they can't lose money. In fact, being stable, bonds are typically where people put money when they're worried about the economy. Treasuries, for example, treasuries are issued by the United States of go government. And if you were to lose money on a treasury in the sense that the the treasury would, would no longer be safe for you, and it, you would have a bankruptcy then, essentially, that you're looking at. The United States government would be bankrupt. So they are considered to be a safe haven 
for assets. And here you can see, we can see a bond. Um, I love this one. It, they used to pay, look at this, four and a quarter percent for a bond uh, that was from 1975 issued. Pretty, pretty darn amazing, right? Pretty darn amazing. We're, we're just not seeing that. In fact, what we're seeing from bonds is that their yields, their returns, that's another word for it, are historically low. So you can see the types of returns bondholders had in 1990. Pretty heady returns, over 8% uh, return from bonds. And what's happened? Well, there's been a slow and steady march downwards where the types of returns we're seeing from bonds now these days are nothing really to get too excited about. Does this mean that you shouldn't have bonds in your portfolio? The answer is no. You should have bonds in your portfolio. The amount, though, is dependent on three factors. Three factors. The first, what's going to allow you to sleep at night to make sure that you feel comfortable in the market. Number two, you need a certain amount of bonds to make sure that you stay committed to your allocation so that if you see large market losses, like here we have the recession that occurred in 2008, we have the recession that occurred in 2001, the recession in 1990. What is the dollar amount in bonds that you need to have so that you don't see such significant losses in your portfolio that you get scared? and you make a knee-jerk reaction, and you sell out at the worst time. And then the third piece, and this is a piece that I feel like a lot of people don't focus on. The amount that you should have in bonds is really the amount that works for your portfolio, that works for your life. Who cares if you're in a beautifully conservative portfolio if it doesn't get you to your retirement goals? and allow you the growth you need to make sure you don't fly through it and find yourself eating cat food at age 85. So that's the third often overlooked piece is, well, what does my portfolio really need to do? And if you need a significant amount of growth from that portfolio, guess what? Guess what? You are not going to be able to have primarily bonds in there because you're just not going to be able to get that growth. You're just not going to. So again, bonds unfortunately, are not as sexy as emerging market stocks, developed international, or even U.S. stocks. But they are necessary to your portfolio. And the amount you need in bonds is based on what's going to let you sleep at night. Number two, what's going to make sure that you stay with the allocation in good times, but even more importantly, in bad times. And then three, what, what is the allocation, the mix of stocks and bonds, that's going to get you to your goals? Because guess what? Guess what? If, if the portfolio is not going to get you to your goals, what are you doing this for anyway? Money is a tool. It is a tool. It is merely a tool to give you the life you deserve, to give you the life that you want to live. And I, I love this. I love this. Instead of just thinking about return on investment, which is so important, but also think about what's your return on life? That's what this money's for is to have fantastic return on life and let you live your life the way you want. So let's talk a little bit about the outlook, a little bit more about where things are. I don't know about you, but I love, love, love getting healthy and being healthy. And so you're going to have to indulge me here because for the first time in nearly a year, I'm able to start running again, getting back in the gym, and I'm feeling, I'm feeling so much better because essentially my t t I had two torn meniscus and it was painful to walk. It was painful to pretty much do anything. Well, now that I have resurgery and I'm doing my PT and I'm recovering, trust me, I am so enjoying being active again. And it made me think about this. It made me think about gyms. So I wanted to show you the valuation of these different investments compared to certain gyms that we all know and love. And at least Equinox, 
Equinox is essentially, it's the Rolls Royce of gems. You walk in, they have beautiful towels. You have gorgeous, gorgeous accommodation all around you. Brand new state-of-the-art equipment. But you bet you pay something for it, right? You pay a lot. In fact, U.S. stocks are considered to be pretty darn expensive, similar to how I think about Equinox. In fact, here we can see that we can look at the U.S. stock valuations. And what we're seeing here is that U.S. stocks are historically expensive versus where they were 10 years ago. And so with that, it's something to think about. It's something to know that U.S. stocks, the type of high returns that you're going to expect from them should be lower. They should be lower because we're already at such high valuation levels. The next one that we're talking about is developed international. And for this, I put New York Sports Club. So New York Sports Club, as you know, it's not the price of an Equinox. It's a step down from that. It's a step down from that. You're definitely getting more value for the money that you spend for New York Sports Club. And here we can see in developed international stocks where U.S. stocks are trading versus where Europe is trading. And you can see very clearly that Europe, the valuation levels are a lot lower, that the prices of these stocks are a lot lower, giving you potentially more opportunity. And we've seen it. We've seen it. Year to date, we're looking at developed international have been returning nearly 15%, whereas U.S. stocks still doing well, still doing well. No one's going to complain, but they're at a lower 9%. And then we have the absolute most bang for your buck type of gym called Blink Fitness. Blink Fitness is, well, it is dirt cheap. It is dirt cheap. But I will tell you that if you're going to go and all you care about working out is working out, then it's a good place to be. In fact, I linked these to what I consider to be for emerging market stocks. Here we've got our U.S., here we've got our Europe, and look at this. Emerging market stocks are trading at even the lowest price-to-earnings ratio, the lowest values, the lowest prices, giving you a huge amount of opportunity to jump in while the prices are still low, get great value for your money, and watching it ride upwards, watching it ride upwards. So what about our portfolio, your portfolio? How does all of this information get distilled, deciphered, and implemented into the portfolio? Well, it's going to be based on what type of recovery do we continue to have? Do we have a bull case where economic growth for the U.S. is actually above our estimates? Is it base case? Essentially, what we're seeing, a, a normal recovery, a normal recovery where it is at similar growth rates and interest rates to where we are today. And then there is the, the bear case, the what I call the oh no case, where the economy falls back into a recession, a longer term recession. I'm not talking about a, a day trade, a, a day change of 1% or 2%. I'm talking about a long term recession. So we have, based on these three different cases, what you can expect with your different investments. And let me go back here. So we believe that the case going forward will be exactly that that we're seeing, which is a base case. And so we have underweighted U.S. company stocks, again, because they appear overvalued and the potential returns are low relative to the risk of holding large company stocks. It's the same story. It's the same story with small company stocks that similar to those large company stocks, they are relatively overvalued. And they also have much more downside, much more potential negatives in poor economic conditions. So if we see a recession, these small company stocks are going to feel it the absolute most. Developed international, 
are attractive, uh, definitely attractive also compared to U.S. stocks. And it's the same thing for emerging markets. Attractive to U.S. stocks, the one piece you have to know is that on a risk-adjusted basis, you have to consider that adding particularly emerging markets, yes, it gives you more diversification, which is very important, but it adds more risk. So when individuals say, why don't we just pull all of our money out of U.S. stocks or pull all of our money out of bonds because we don't expect U.S. stocks or bonds to have huge, heady returns going forward, let's throw it all into emerging markets. Our answer, our answer to that is no. No, because you want to make sure that you have a diversified portfolio and you don't want to catch yourself in the negative, never going to pay out behavior of market timing. We know that day traders underperform. We know that market timers underperform. And you don't want to be one of them. Now, for bonds, it's important. Investment bank bonds, we have a less, we have, we're underweighted on those two. Instead, we have bonds that are much more flexible with shorter durations that are less impacted by interest rate rises, which is very clear, very clearly the right path, especially in this environment where we expect the Federal Reserve to continue to increase interest rates. So what do you do with all this? We've got some tips here. These are the takeaway tips, the get your pen out, the things to write down, and remember, no pain, no gain. And I told myself this morning when I was at physical therapy in unbelievable pain, um, trying to recover my leg and get it back to the strength that it was before the surgery, and actually, to be honest, even before my, my injury, there's no pain, no gain. It's the same thing with your investment portfolio, that your reward in your portfolio is directly related to the risk. So if you're in a portfolio of 80% bonds and 20% stocks, your risk is pretty low, and you're not going to expect a huge reward. You're not going to expect huge returns. However, if you're in the opposite, then you're going to expect higher returns. So why is it no pain, no gain? Well, because what we see is that there's much more volatility to those portfolios that have mostly stocks in there. In fact, you can see here, going all the way back to 1988, we put this beautiful chart together to show you, if you had invested in 100% U.S. stocks, how volatile. I mean, that, that looks to me, we just went down to Disney with my, my dad and, and my two kids, and we went on the Aerosmith roller coaster, and this reminds me of the Aerosmith roller coaster, uh, exactly. If you get down to here, let's say only 25% stocks and 75% bonds, look how even this this actually went out. In fact, we read we went on a roller coaster for kids, and, and that was a little bit more my speed. And I, I liken it more so to that allocation of, again, 25% stocks, 75% bonds. But again, it shows you your risk and your reward. And it shows you very clearly, well, you're you're definitely rewarded for that uh, huge 100% allocation in stocks. Uh, essentially, $10,000 invested would grow have grown to $100,000 today versus that $10,000 invested back in 88. Well, it would not have grown that significantly. It would have grown to about 30000 if you had that only 25% exposure to stocks and 75 to bonds. So this is something to think about. What's going to let you sleep at night but also what portfolio is going to get you to your goals. And understanding your risk tolerance, we all say we can handle risk, but I have to tell you, most people have no clue how much risk they can handle until they lose money. And when they lose money, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they realize that they were not as risky as an investor. And one of the best ways to protect yourself is to be financially fit. And that means understanding your investments. It's understanding also 
your asset classes and the mix between stocks and bonds and what they are for you. Understanding your long-term financial picture and that this portfolio isn't just for today or tomorrow. It's for you out until age 95. In fact, I love what, I love what Peter Lynch said. Peter Lynch, another fabulously smart gentleman in the area of investing, know what you own and know why you own own it. This is why you need to be financially fit. Know what you own and know the role it plays in your portfolio, the importance. And if you want to pretend that you can market time, that you can throw all your money into emerging market stocks and know the day to pull it out and pull it into the next investment that you think you know the answer, let me just tell you, you don't. Each one of these colors going, and you can see I go all the way back to 2002, it shows you the asset class that had the highest return and then the lowest. And if, if, you, could, if you could figure out what the pattern is here, let me know, because we can both retire and go to the Bahamas and have beautiful pina coladas with umbrellas and maraschino cherries. There's no rhyme or reason. There's no rhyme or reason. And you can't predict with certainty what the top performing and the lowest performing asset class is going to be. It's very important to own them all. And here in 2016, you can see one of the top performers was emerging markets. But look what happened the year before. Emerging markets did awful. So this is really important. It's really important to really understand that you need to have a diversified portfolio no matter what. And it is important to control your emotions. I love this quote, keep calm and control your emotions. And uh, I travel to England quite often because my husband is British. Um, So my whole family is there on his side. But then my side of the family, my brother moved over to to London as well. So I hear the keep calm and carry on. You know, you see that infiltrated in my life everywhere, especially when I go and travel. And, And this essentially is just telling you, you know, don't make your investing decisions based on one event. Don't uh, have a knee-jerk reaction. In fact, what I just want to say is just don't, don't do it. Don't sell all at once because we know that in order to maximize profits, you, it's never, ever a good idea to sell, particularly when the market is tanking and everyone is panicking. Not everything is going to decline, and it's not the end of the world. And if you're a long-term investor, and you should only be in the stock market, if you are a long-term investor, then you don't need to panic. Because you should really be looking for the long-term. You should be looking at the long-term, the horizon, focusing on that long-term goal. And again, I'm I'm going to quote Peter Lynch because he knows what he's talking about. And he says, in the long run, it's not just how much money you make that will determine your future prosperity. It's how much of that money you put to work by saving and investing. And when times get scary, just remember, you do have control. You may not have control over the market, but you bet you have control over how you spend the money, how much you save, and how you invest it. So in those scary times, know that you have control. And this is really one of the most important pieces is to make sure that you're putting the right amount of money away and to make sure that it's invested wisely. And if you have any questions, any questions whatsoever, I encourage you to reach out to us. We'll do a personalized analysis of your financial situation at no cost. We'll see, are you on track to reach your goals? What are the gaps? And what needs to happen to fill that gap? We have a fantastic team here that will map out that entire financial picture. And they're going to let you know one of three things. Number one, that you're on track and that the advisors you're working with are doing a fantastic job. And you've got a lot of peace of mind and feel even more confident about the team you have. It could be that that advisory team... There are some improvements to be made, but for some reason, we're not the right fit. 
And if we're not the right fit, we guarantee we will send you to a wealth manager that we know, like, and trust. And third, it could be that, again, there's a lot of improvement to be made in your portfolio, and you are the right fit. You do feel like Francis Financial would be a right, the right team player for you. And we can work together. But no matter what, you're going to walk away with more knowledge, more information. And what's most important is to be financially fit. Financially fit not only with your investments, but also with your long-term goals and making sure that you're sticking with that plan, that long-term plan to achieve the life you need. Because you know, ROI, return on investment, it is important. We live and breathe investments all day, but we know it's a tool. These investments, this money, it is a tool for ROL, and that is return on life. So please reach out to us and call with any questions. You have our contact information, 212-374-9008. You can also email me, info at francisfinancial.com, or my personal email here, Stacy, S-T-A-C-Y, at francisfinancial.com. Thank you so much for your time. I'm so proud that you're here investing in yourself because the best investment you can ever make, it is your portfolio, but more importantly, it's investing in yourself. So thank you.